works and how medicine has evolved. This is my personal favorite uh, conspiracy theory. So the that um, electronic diagram on the right that says COVID-19 5G chip diagram is actually the um, electronic plan or guts for the thing on the left, which is a mediocre guitar pedal. And this is one that made the uh, rounds on Twitter, mostly in Europe again. And so, and then this is just a quote from Dr. Fauci from just a few days ago that I think most of you are probably familiar with. Directed at our senator. Yeah. So, um, you know, and there's these different criticisms about the COVID-19 vaccine. It was rushed. The technology is untested. Uh, the vaccine's worse than the disease. Um, there's all this stuff about Bill Gates and 5G. Um, there's some uh, concerns about fertility that maybe, um, uh, you know, certainly aren't proven, but, you know, could possibly exist. So... A big topic these days, now that the vaccine for COVID-19 is more widely available, at least in the United States, is who chooses to get the vaccine and why and why not. Um, and, and we're trying to make this interactive, so feel free to jump in, anybody. Um, and if the infectious disease doctors have anything to add, we're happy to hear it. Um, some of the concerns regarding the vaccine, there's multiple potential reasons why people might not be interested in getting the vaccine. And, and one that I find interesting is this concern about long-term effects on fertility. Um, this is not something that could be easily disproven because of course the vaccine has not been around long enough for us to have had years long data for the most part in a large population. And it, it became apparent at our institution in particular, but also across the country really, that there were different rates of vaccination um, acceptance amongst even amongst healthcare workers and people who work in hospitals and this is not meant to point fingers at any particular group but it was interesting on a population level to note that physicians for example we have one of the highest vaccination rates for COVID-19 and nurses and other medical staff have lower yeah. rates and I think the question <laughs> comes up why is that um, what, what's different about the nurse population compared to say the physician population. And one possible reason, I'm not saying this is backed up by definitive data, is um, nurses on average tend to be, to skew more female, for example, younger. Um, and so maybe these fertility concerns play more of a role in those types of decisions. And so with that introduction, that context, we're gonna sort of step back in history and. Uh, I'm going to propose a question here first, um, and, and this is the question. Um, do you agree with this statement? Therapy should be subjected to rigorous clinical trials prior to their widespread use in humans. All right, and oh, can, we, can we do a poll? Is that possible? Julia? Yes, uh, one moment. Thanks, Annie. This is a test, Chief. I'm just joking. All right, so um, looks like we've had 22 people participate. 21 said that therapy should be uh, subjected to rigorous clinical trials prior to their widespread use. They agree with that uh, statement. And one said, uh, no, they should not. And so uh, that's interesting. So let's, uh, let's take a look. All right, and so I think a lot of you are thinking about this pyramid on the left that you've probably learned at some point in your training, where at the base of the pyramid, we have the weakest uh, evidence, but it's more common to have case reports and opinions and so forth. And then as you go up the pyramid, the evidence gets stronger, but it's harder to do, right? And so you get to randomized controlled trials and then meta-analysis and systematic reviews we think of as the sort of the pinnacle of scientific knowledge. 
okay? And then you can see this uh, stuff on the right. Um, and, and so that's interesting. So this is a study, uh, a systematic review that was done uh, in the British uh, Medical Journal back in 2003. Okay, parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge. Systematic review of randomized controlled trials. So that's, that's interesting. Uh, you know, we're looking for randomized controlled trials to determine whether parachutes are effective in preventing major trauma related to gravitational challenge. And you can see this is very well-defined, uh, well-designed. Uh, it's a well-defined outcome measure well-designed systematic review, uh, so uh, death or major trauma defined as an injury severity score greater than 15. And unfortunately, these authors were not able to identify any randomized controlled trials of parachute intervention. And so the 21 of you uh, that wanted to do randomized controlled trials prior to using uh, a therapy uh, might want to rethink that. Right? But it's okay because someone actually did a randomized control trial. These authors, this was in 2018, again in British Medical uh, Journal. So they got 23 people to jump out of a plane, and they had 12 with a parachute on and 11 with just a backpack. And their outcome measure was death or traumatic injury, and they actually found no difference in traumatic injury between the two groups, which is interesting. And they concluded that parachute use did not reduce death or major traumatic injury when jumping from aircraft. And this is the first randomized evaluation of this intervention. This is a photo of one of their subjects. Uh, so this is straight from the article. And as you can see, she jumps about two feet and uh, presumably landed uninjured. So this is a quote from the article. When beliefs regarding the effectiveness of an intervention exist in the community, Randomized trials evaluating their effectiveness could selectively enroll individuals with lower likelihood of benefit, thereby diminishing the applicability of trial results to routine practice. Therefore, although we can confidently recommend that individuals jumping from small stationary aircraft on the ground do not require parachutes, individual judgment should be exercised when applying these findings at higher altitudes. This is obviously very tongue in cheek, but sometimes uh, when dealing with the vaccine hesitant, it feels like we're stepping to this level. And so let's talk about an actual randomized controlled trial, uh, or at least one that involved a therapy that we all know about, and that's a drug called cyclosporin. Uh, that's its uh, chemical form on the right. It was discovered in 1970. We know it's an immunosuppressant. It's used in anti-transplant uh, rejection, and it prevents uh, graft-versus-host disease as well. Very common drug, we've all used it. And so I, I just want to show you, this is a, actually on the University of Pittsburgh campus, this statue of uh, Thomas Starzl, uh, and this quote, this, uh, this history, cannot, so this is talking about uh, organ transplantation. The history cannot be dissociated from one man, Thomas E. Starzl, whose pioneering efforts contributed more than anyone else to what has become a routinely successful clinical procedure. All right, and Dr. Starr knew a lot about conducting research and uh, randomized controlled trials. This, um, and I just did this a couple of weeks ago, but if you um, uh, put his name in PubMed, you can see he had uh, almost 1,800 results. The guy published a lot of papers during a lifetime. And he actually did the initial cyclosporin trials uh, for transplant rejection. This little timeline just shows the drug was discovered, and then in 1980, small pilot, uh, and this was in liver transplantation, where 11 out of 12 people survived for greater than one year. For the first time, it looked as if liver replacement might be more than a curiosity and a subject ethical debate. And then time marches on, and you know, as the 80s progressed, there were 808 uh, just pediatric patients in Pittsburgh got liver transplants. But the story is a little more complex than that. So before cyclosporin was used in liver transplant, and this is from actually one of Starville's articles from the 70s, survival from liver transplant was abysmal. And you can see this is a time series. It's years on the bottom there. So very few people made it beyond the first really six months. Uh, also, um, for those of you who don't know, apparently you used to have to hand draw your own figures and submit them to journals. Uh, and that's what this is. 
So in 1981 in the New England Journal, Dr. Starzl and his team published this paper, liver transplantation with the use of cyclosporin A and prednisone. So they added cyclosporin to steroids, all right? And this is that study that I referenced. Uh, and uh, so 11 out of 12 subjects survived for a year. Remember that graph I just showed you, that six month survival was abysmal. Now folks were surviving, or most of them, for a year. And he said the follow-up period in this small number of patients is still short. However, it is unlikely that this striking improvement in the early results after liver replacement could be a statistical accident. Now it's a line straight from the article. This is a, the cover of a book from Thomas Starzl. This is his uh, autobiography. It's an interesting read. Um, and, I, and, just, and I'm going to read to you a few lines from the book. Uh, because it's really interesting and really speaks to how randomized controlled trials sort of came to where they are sitting near the top of that pyramid uh, and maybe some of the dangers of thinking that way. By the end of 1980, the superiority of cyclosporin steroid treatment had been well established for both kidney and liver transplantation, and it was assumed that this advance would apply to the heart as well. Although patient and graft survival after liver transplantation appeared to have been doubled, there was nearly continuous pressure to conduct a randomized trial. It seemed to us that randomization between a superior versus less effective drug regimen would create a profound inequity in the recipient population. In our opinion, a randomized controlled trial, if it was to be ethical, should be done only if we weren't certain that there was a treatment difference. So that's interesting, and it, it brought some questions to mind, and I'd like to, you know, hear some responses uh, from the audience from Dr. Knapp. So um, if I needed a new question, I would want a therapy that worked. When, is, is there ever a time when we could ignore the call for a randomized controlled trial? And what about me? I'm a pediatrician, uh, and are there many randomized controlled trials for therapies that we commonly use in children? And of course, I don't want therapies to be used like it's the Wild West. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, the recent COVID pandemic, there were early on, there were all, uh, all sorts of drugs being bantied about that were going to be effective. Uh, who decides when a randomized controlled trial is necessary? Does anybody have any thoughts on any of those things? Yeah, randomized controlled trials when you have a one proven treatment that we know is safe and effective as a comparator study uh, is reasonable to then have a randomized control trial when there's a standard. You know, the idea of you know the heart transplant with cyclosporin versus we've never done heart transplants and have anything to compare it to except what we've done with livers is quite different than when you have one standard of treatment that you know is safe and effective is something uh, non-inferior or is it a comparator? Hey, this is Kyle. Um, I agree with Dr. Shickley, obviously uh, using different kinds of designs, uh, using different kinds of comparators is um, a key way to sort of conduct ethically appropriate clinical trials. But I also just wanted to add that you're, you're kind of pointing out the history, Carrie, that um, Medicine has a long and in some ways sordid history of overestimating the effectiveness of interventions. Um, and we, we're doing that even to today, as you said, during COVID. So um, we, we uh, see, you know, really striking improvement, but then we, uh, that biases our overall view of the population and we, we can't see how there's not really a meaningful improvement so anyway, yeah, I'm a strong supporter of clinical trials. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Schickler, Dr. Brothers. So a question for the group and particularly for the trainees listening in, um, what do you think we should set as the circumstances or the conditions under which a randomized controlled trial should be performed? And can you think of any medical terminology 
for the conditions that should be present in order for us to be able to go forward with a randomized, randomized control trial. I mean, if you're pretty sure, is that good enough? Who decides? How much data do you need? These are sort of the questions that are, that they were questions at the time and to some degree even now, they're questions that don't necessarily have straightforward answers. Any, any thoughts? I'll, um, I'll move on to introduce this concept. It may be familiar. Um, again, this is sort of geared towards the trainees. So there's a concept called clinical equ equipoise that was first described in the medical literature in 1987 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the, the basic idea had been sort of bandied about prior to that, but um, Dr. Friedman, this was a seminal article where uh, Dr. Friedman defined clinical equipoise as the existence of, quote, genuine uncertainty in the expert medical community over whether a treatment or an intervention would be beneficial. And um, according, to this according to this concept, if there is genuine uncertainty within the community at large and not necessarily on the part of the individual physician or investigator, that, that condition is satisfied. So different people are going to have different beliefs, just as Dr. Starzl did, for example. But does the entire community agree or is there debate? That's really the central point here. And so sort of just circling back to this, so as Dr. Knapp pointed out, clinical equipoise is a concept that uh, came uh, into being in 1987, and it seemed like the transplant folks were alluding to this uh, several years earlier. Uh, and this is Dr. Starzl's sort of how this turned out. So he thought it was clear that cyclosporin worked in 1980. In 1981, the IRB, where he was, which was in Pittsburgh, insisted that a randomized controlled trial, initially they wanted to do it for liver and kidney transplant and heart transplant, but they eventually excluded liver and heart transplant and only did a randomized controlled trial for kidney transplant, and this was in 1981, and that trial was abandoned after 100 patients uh, because it was, uh, it was abundantly clear at that point that cyclosporin uh, was far superior to uh, no cyclosporine. So just as an example of how sometimes, despite our best efforts to make decisions based on data, sometimes it's, it's really just not that straightforward. Um, there was a, a big study published in 2002 in JAMA. Um, it was done by a cooperative group, the Women's Health Initiative. Um, and they looked at thousands and thousands of women who had received uh, hormone replacement therapy, HRT. So basically this is a treatment for menopause and menopausal symptoms. So sometimes this includes estrogen and sometimes it includes estrogen and progesterone, essentially. Um, and this study was sort of focused on possible toxicities associated with this long-term therapy. and they showed that there was a statistically significant increase in the risk of breast cancer with combination HRT in particular. And this was a big deal at the time and there was a lot of discussion about it. Um, there was a lot of feeling of, oh my goodness, I cannot believe these have all been prescribed treatment that has increased their risk of cancer, that's terrible. So there really was a trend leading away from the use of HRT for menopausal symptoms as a result of this study. And basically what I find interesting is in the years since then, it turns out, as is often the case, the data and, and the reality, it's, it's more complex than that. Um, and in fact, controversy still exists today to my understanding. Um, so once they parsed out sort of more detailed analysis of the data, it looks like, for example, Estrogen-only HRT is not as bad as combination HRT, so that's um, interesting to note. There are still there are still some wish it, some situations in which HRT is completely contraindicated. For example, for a woman who's had a history of breast cancer herself, but a lot of women were basically being told that there was no good treatment for their significant menopausal symptoms, 
and you know there there's there are implications to that as well to inadequately treating someone's symptoms and medical condition and so basically I think that most people probably would agree today that there is some role for HRT in select populations and so we don't want to jump to conclusions even when we have good data st statistically significant data because the because there can always be more information to come forth. Um, okay, so then moving to a topic that's, of course, um, near and dear to me. Um, just a side note, I think you're officially a science nerd when you're recommending that someone watch a PBS documentary for fun, but here I am doing it. So I highly recommend reading a great book called The Emperor of All Maladies. And there was also a PBS documentary, a two-part documentary um, that by the same title. And, it's, and it goes into the history of cancer, spanning back even thousands of years. Um, so just going into the history of um, chemotherapy in children and the treatment of cancer in children, there were many people who were involved in these initial trials. The first one that I'll mention is Sidney Farber. He was a pediatric patho pathologist at Boston Children's Hospital. And um, he was, he and others were responsible for some of the first clinical trials using chemotherapy in children with leukemia. Um, initially, there was a lot of um, use of antifolate agents, aminopterin, which basically is similar to methotrexate, which we still use extensively today. At the time, leukemia had been described as early as the mid-1800s, and yet there really had not been any major progress in terms of its treatment in children or adults, really. Um, so this idea that, you know, that children could be given experimental drugs with no idea whether they would work or not, and maybe there would be some side effects associated. Um, a lot of people thought he was completely crazy, honestly. Um, there was a lot of, and he was a pathologist, so I think there was, even within the medical community, some resentment of, you know, what do you think you're doing? You're just a pathologist, get back to the basement. His lab was literally in the basement of what was then Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and there was really a lot of debate uh, amongst the medical community and outside of it about what he was doing here. Um, there were many others involved in these, again, early trials for the treatment of cancer. Um, and there was a man named Min Chu Li, who um, was orig originally from China. He was a researcher here in the United States. And um, he and others did some really interesting trials using, at this point, there had been some preliminary data on the antifolates in children with leukemia. And so he decided to apply this to women with choriocarcinoma, which at the time had a terrible prognosis. And it was really, a, honestly, a horrible way to die. Um, and so he started administering antifolates to women with choriocarcinoma. And there was really quite a dramatic clinical response. And so people were kind of accepting of this research um, to some degree, but then he decided to do something really crazy and he decided to monitor serum HCG levels. And he had this inkling that sometimes the, the women would have clinical response before the HCG would become undetectable. And so at that point, most people said, you know, if the tumor's gone, you can stop now. And he really wanted to pursue this idea of continuing to administer treatment until those levels were undetectable. And again, this, this did not meet with a good response. He was actually fired from the NCI. And um, he eventually, I think, ended up at Sloan Kettering. So I think he didn't, that wasn't the end of his career completely. But he really was censured and, you know, publicly embarrassed and told that this was inappropriate and that he was harming women. Um, later, when they, when they analyzed long-term data, that it showed that the women who had been treated by Dr. Lee, um, with, until, those until those HCG levels were undetectable, they actually had a much better outcome. The women who were only treated until there was a gross response 
a lot of those women, a lot of those patients ended up relapsing. But he had already lost his job by then. And one of one of the early investigators who was sort of collaborating in this research, he said later, Lee was accused of experimenting on people, but of course all of us were experimenting. To not experiment would mean to follow the old rules, to do absolutely nothing. So is that a dirty word, experimenting? Is that something that's harmful? Is that something that we should not be doing? That was really the crux of this debate. All right, and so just sort of wrapping this up, this is from that first systematic review that I showed you. And this was their conclusion. Only two options exist. The first is that we accept that under exceptional circumstances, common sense might be applied when considering the potential risks and benefits of interventions. The second is that we continue our quest for the holy grail of exclusively evidence-based interventions and preclude parachute use outside the context of a properly conducted trial. And so, you know, I think that, that is there's more nuance to it than a simple yes or no in the poll we proposed at the very beginning. We're going to move on and talk a little bit about cell lines. And some of you may be familiar with this, uh, this story because Oprah was involved with a, a movie, a documentary about it. But there was a woman called Henrietta Lacks who was born in 1920 and worked as a tobacco farmer. She dropped out of school and uh, married a man called David Lax and had five children. And then she died in 1951 of metastatic cervical cancer. And there was a man called George Otto Gay who was uh, born in Pittsburgh and got a biology degree uh, and got married and got an MD and he worked as a cell biologist. And he died of pancreatic cancer in 1970. And it turns out that these two people's lives have interconnected in a way that has really affected science um, for the last 75 years in a very profound way because uh, at the time when uh, Henrietta Lacks was diagnosed, cervical cancer was treated with radium. And biopsies of the cancerous tissue uh, from her cervix were taken without her permission by her treating uh, physician. Samples were given to Dr. Gay, the man I just introduced you to, and he observed that the cells reproduced at a high rate and could be kept alive for long periods of time, and this was very novel. And so he had his lab assistant take more samples of these remarkable cells from this woman post-mortem, and they got no permission. They just took the cells, and uh, his team isolated uh, one specific cell and just rapid repeated division. And this was important because it meant that experiments could take place on these cells. You could make lots of them, and the cells were all exactly the same. You didn't have to account for differences between the cells. And this became known as the Gila Immortal Cell Line. And there was this book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, uh, that is uh, another one that we would recommend to you. This cell line became very important. They were the first cells ever to be cloned, as I just discussed. They've been used in virology, HIV, genetics, and cancer research. The gentleman on the left uh, won a Nobel Prize for linking HPV with cervical cancer, leading to development of the HPV vaccine. <clears throat> and as of 2009, at least, 60,000 papers have been published that use these cells. This sort of activity uh, has happened even more recently. So this is a su uh, summary of a California Supreme Court case that was decided in 1990. So there was a patient that was being treated for hairy cell leukemia. And the patient's doctor, Dr. Gold, harvested some of the patient's cells and realized that something in these cells stimulated white blood suction. And he, from these, uh, from these cells, he purified uh, well, what is now GMCSF, from these cells and patented it and he made a lot of money. The patient got an inkling that this happened and he sued and he lost. And the court ruled at the time, this was in 1990, that discarded tissue is no longer the property of the patient. And consequently, consents uh, became more detailed. This little sentence is from the uh, court decision. We hold that a physician who is seeking a patient's consent for a medical procedure must, in order to satisfy his fiduciary duty and to obtain the patient's informed consent, disclose personal interests unrelated to the patient's health, whether research or economic, that may affect his medical judgment. 
Um, this was a, an interesting decision, I think, on, on many levels. I mean, you couldn't have, there has been much scholarship and discussion on this, on this case and the legal precedent that it set alone. Um, I, I do think, I, it's very interesting. I don't know how realistic that is. I mean, I don't think this, in a lot of situations, including probably this one would be my guess, I don't think the doctor went in there before the procedure. This is probably a routine procedure, only after the cells were obtained and the, and the sample was obtained, did he notice, oh, hey, these cells are really interesting. So um, do we need to rethink informed consent? I think that's a very reasonable argument to be made. But yeah, the legal decision that was made, um, they basically, not all the, this, this went all the way to the Supreme Court and not all the Supreme Court justices agreed, um, but the majority opinion was that, well, we don't wanna hamper medical research. And so that was part of their argument for, for not siding with, with Mr. Moore. Um, but, and I think we, we all agree, no, we don't want to hamper medical research, but does that mean you don't have the ability to be properly informed about what samples are being taken and for what purpose? I, I believe in the, the majority opinion, there was some argument that, well, he probably wouldn't have said no anyway. I don't know that that means you can assume that he should not have had a choice. Um, but yes, Dr. Gold went on to make lots of money off of this, and that sort of brings up the question of who should profit and who owns this material? Does the patient own the, the tissue itself? Is it the piece of tissue? Is it the genomic information? Do you own your own genome, for example, or do you have control over that? Um, after this, legal decision came out, um, Michael Crichton, there's, there's going to be a long reading list, by the way, at the end, so just add this to your list. Michael Crichton, who is a gen, as some people may know, um, actually wrote a book based on this decision, and it's a typical Michael Crichton book. It's a little, it, it's a little dramatic, I would say, and at points he, he takes things to a, to an absurd conclusion, but the premise of the book basically is that there's a guy whose genetic material turns out to be really interesting and, and useful to researchers, and it ends in this, there's a, it's been a while since I read it, but there's a high-speed car chase where these bad guys in white coats are chasing him down, and he's hiding in a van under produce or something, I'm just making that up, um, because they own his material, and I mean, it seems absurd, right, but but there really have been instances where there's been attempts at ownership of, of genomic information, for example, or tissues or um, samples obtained from, from human beings. Um, Michael Crichton on his website talks a lot about, um, let's see, this might be on the next slide, um, whether you should be able to patent genes. And at the time that he wrote this book, you could, you could patent a gene. Um, there's a company named Myriad that owned the rights to BRCA1 and BRCA2. So all women who, all patients who wanted to be tested for these genes, which BRCA1 and BRCA2 are involved in cancer predisposition, this testing had to be done through Myriad. They, they had a patent. They could charge whatever they liked. Um, this was initially patented in the 1990s. I mean, this is really in the infancy of sort of this new genome era in many ways. And it wasn't struck down by the Supreme Court till 2013, which is really not that long ago, mm -hmm. actually. Um, personally, I mean, I think it's crazy that you would be able to patent a gene. This was not pat a patent on the technology for sequencing this gene. It was this gene cannot be tested or sequenced by anyone other than this private company. Um, so I think it's, this just shows that, you know, this technology and the science, um, we're, it's all new. We're still getting used to it. The law sometimes doesn't, you know, I'd, I'd love to think of the law as this sort of final all-seeing arbiter, but it's really not. And I think even very smart legal st scholars sometimes, you know, they're not always consistent and sometimes there's a struggle to really think about what is the legal precedent that we want to set and what sort of principles should apply here. Uh, does someone have a question, Vita? Hi, this is Vida. I'm Hi. actually the director of the Courthouse Library, library. and also, and also um, a member of the ARB. I'm just going to be interested in this. 
currently the oversight of tissue and, and research products that come from the subject are highly regulated. And I'm not an expert on there, I can't go into it, but I know that the, the cases that you're talking about have had a huge impact on the IRB and subject safety oversight process. Thank, thank you for that comment. And then um, Dr. Knapp, Dr. Marshall uh, uh, said, without patent protection, what is the incentive for industry to discover new genes? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And so, uh, these are very utilitarian type of arguments as the Supreme Court made in the Moore v. Regions of California case. How are, we, how are we best going to encourage research? How are we going to progress science? Um, and to what degree do we need to protect, say, privacy um, in, the, in the attempt to do so? Um, well, obviously, I do not have the end-all, be-all answer to that question. Um, I do think that based on sort of current trends, um, there's still, there is still money to be made, even without patenting particular genes. And even in the oncology realm, there are plenty of private companies that are more than willing to sequence our patients, as we've discovered. And this is not unique to oncology um, for certain genes. So hopefully this, would, this legal precedent would not hamper medical research. And, and so, and so that's Oprah on the left. I think she played Henry Lack's uh, granddaughter in the movie. Um, and we kind of have gone through this, but just to bring those two pieces together, uh, Moore v. Uh, the California Regents um, was cited uh, really as a reason why Henry Lack's family wasn't compensated for the use of their genome. It was their relative's genome. Uh, but the NIH made a deal with the family uh, relatively recently. Uh, they get real, uh, limited control over uh, access to the sequence, uh, and the family gets acknowledged in publications that use it, but they don't get any um, financial compensation. Uh, Dr. Azamoa points out the government paid for the human genome projects, so individual companies cannot patent gene uh, taxpayer money paid for, which is a reasonable case, and at least. Uh, in America, and we've gone through some of this, uh, sparked a little bit of discussion here. So uh, the HeLa cell line, it's there, right? We can't make it go away. We've opened the box, but it was obtained via means that we would not consider to be legal or ethical today, right? So can we use treatments that have been established that were based on the HeLa cell line? Um, can we keep using those cell lines for further research? You know, uh, Dr. Knapp uh, talked about how, and, and uh, Vita uh, on there talked about uh, how the consent process has uh, has changed based on some of these Supreme Court cases or court cases. And then, you know, what about genomic sequencing on bank specimens? Uh, right. Some of these samples maybe were taken a long time ago, and the consent process at the time that they were obtained was pretty perfunctory, and there was probably no mention of, oh, well, your entire genome could be sequenced based on this piece of tissue that we obtained 30 years ago, and maybe we're going to profit off of that information. These are all questions that, again, don't necessarily have a clear answer. But I think, it, I think one sort of theme that comes up is that what the relative cultural norms are at a particular given moment in time, especially as relates to medical ethics and research ethics, those change. And so we're going to round this back together. Randomized controlled trials, cell lines, vaccine hesitancy, and we're going to talk about the development of polio, polio vaccine. And so this was uh, Dr. Fauci again on July 17th. So if we had had the pushback for vaccines the way we're seeing on certain media, we probably would still have smallpox and we would probably still have polio in this country if we had the kind of false information that's being spread now. So just to review some of the history for those of you who aren't alive, uh, weren't alive uh, during the polio epidemic, and I, I was not, I had to read up on this. Um, so it was recognized in 1916. There were a lot of cases and a fair number of deaths by the 1950s. And you can see there in 1957, 21,000 people were paralyzed. 
uh, was thought to be due to uh, improved sanitation, and so infants were not exposed and thereby, thereby not developing immunity as infants before the disease could affect them in these uh, profound ways. Uh, so this is a quote from a newspaper article from last year. Though less fatal and prevalent than COVID-19, polio stoked intense fears and anxiety in households across the country. It did not spur shutdowns, but it changed daily life for many. Swimming pools and movie theaters closed. Expectant parents snapped up polio-specific insurance policies. Polio was a plague. One day you had a headache and an hour later you were paralyzed. How far the virus crept up your spine determined whether you could walk afterwards or even breathe. Parents waited fearfully every summer to see if it would strike. One case turned up and then another. The count began to climb. The city closed the swimming pools and we all stayed home, cooped indoors, shunning other children. Summer seemed like winter then. So this is just sort of, uh, you know, an oral history. Uh, that I had read in this uh, device on the left is what's called an iron, uh, an iron lung, which I think most of you are familiar with. So here's another person. So Dr. Jonas Salk, born in New York City and got his MD from NYU, wound up in Pittsburgh, uh, as did almost everybody in this whole talk. Um, and he, uh, I think what Dr. Caparell is trying to say is Pittsburgh is the best. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> um, he started working on the polio vaccine in 1948. And in 1955, as polio vaccine came into commercial use, the story's a little more complicated than that. Because again, uh, these HeLa cells were involved. So um, cells were needed to test the development of antibodies for polio vaccines. And it turned out that HeLa cells were easily infected with polio. And as we know, they're highly uh, proliferative. And so the Tuskegee Institute was chosen by the NIH to produce HeLa cells and supply them to researchers all over the country. Uh, and this included Dr. Salk. Uh, and so the uh, vaccine was shown to work in uh, HeLa cells, and it was first tested in humans in 1952. Small trial published in JAMA in 1953, that was in March. And then in May, and this is a picture of Dr. Salk's kitchen, that boy there is his son Peter, and that is Dr. Salk injecting this kind of untested vaccine, or sort of tested vaccine, into his smiling son, although uh, the smile, it turns out, was uh, fake. <laughs> he wasn't excited. Right? Uh, but then the things just kind of took off from there in 1940, uh, 54 and 55. Uh, a broader uh, scale trial was completed, and then the vaccine was licensed, and there was max, mass immunization. And you can see, um, so in 1952, at the start of that timeline, 53,000 cases of uh, polio. In 1957, down to 56,000 and then just 161 in 1961. This vaccination was carried out in schools. Um, as you can see there on the right, this is a photo of some folks giving vaccinations. And the curious fellow there actually grew up to be our very own Gary Marshall. <laughs> I hope he's watching. <laughs> he is. You're not allowed to give grand rounds and not include a reference to Gary Marshall, yeah. I believe. It's like a tax, uh, you know, the Gary Marshall tax. So, uh, uh, you know, the headline, Salt Conquers Polio. You can see Elvis Presley there getting his immunization. But, you know, there even then there was pushback. So his patriotism was questioned. He had so-called leftist leanings and was invest being investigated actively by the FBI at this time. This is Dr. Salk. Um, some people were suspicious because he didn't patent the polio vaccine, and that seemed uh, un-American. And he, his line was, there is no patent. Could you patent the sun? And he was widely recognized for stating that, although the story is maybe a little more complicated than that. Uh, at any rate, uh, and then the American Medical Association, the Eisenhower administration, they resisted funding the mass and Asian campaign that was needed because they were fearful of introducing socialized medicine. And you can see here, um, these are mostly um, sort of Asian, European conspiracy theories that still exist about the polio vaccine. Uh, and Bill Gates uh, even being involved in these uh, conspiracy theories. This is even today, you can see, you know, these are dated 2019 and 2020. So just a, one question uh, I had, and that was, it seems absurd to inject family members with untested vaccine. How recently was this an acceptable practice, if it ever was? And then, you know, a comment that the polio vaccine was met with resistance 
even as people feared for the lives of their children. Nothing has changed. So um, that was all we were going to talk about today. We open it up for discussion. So Laura Bishop said, uh, it was interesting to read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. <clears throat> Um, financial compensation was sought by some family members, but specifically her daughter really was looking for transparency about the use of her mother's cells earlier. Healthcare literacy played a huge role as the family really didn't know what exactly was being done with their mom's cells. This made part of the revised consent process. Uh, and then Dr. Marshall, adding to our reading list, there's a great book on the history of polio vaccine called Patenting the Sun by Jane Smith. This reading list is getting longer and longer. All right, thank you. Some references uh, there as well. Um, questions or other thoughts, discussion? Great job, uh, guys. Um, this is this is Gary Marshall. So, um, <clears throat> so the whole polio history brings up so many other issues. The field trial in 1954 that proved that the vaccine worked involved 1.4 million children who were randomized to either vaccine or placebo. This would be an impossible thing to do today. And, you know, if, if they had had the technology that, that would make it easier to determine if the vaccine worked with fewer kids, it would have been, you know, think of how many kids actually got polio uh, because they were in the placebo group in a trial that was that large. I mean, the, the largest clinical trials for the currently licensed vaccines that we have were probably the rotavirus vaccine, which was only 70,000 kids randomized to vaccine or placebo. That, that's interesting, Dr. Marshall. How many, uh, how many kids in the COVID trials, uh, you know, sort of all together? What's the intended enrollment? Well, as you know, so in the, in the adult trials that led to the EUA, um, there were about 30 or 40,000 people for each of the vaccines that were randomized to vaccine or placebo. And that was a one-to-one -one randomization. For the teenagers, it was less because it, we already knew it worked in the adults. So um, the numbers didn't need to be as high. For the young kids, which the trials we're doing now, um, efficacy against disease is not the endpoint. It's a secondary endpoint. The primary endpoint is immunogenicity. So the studies are going to look at antibody levels post-vaccine in the kids, compare them to antibody levels in the adults in whom we know the vaccine already works. So that's the concept called immunogenicity bridging. And it's a good example of how we've been able to um, avert the ethical dilemma of doing a randomized controlled trial looking at efficacy with lar larger numbers of kids because we, we can use a surrogate of efficacy and use and have a smaller number of kids. I think there's about 4,500 kids will be enrolled in the, in the six months to 11 years old clinical trials, uh, at least for the Pfizer vaccine. And we, we didn't talk about sort of surrogates for efficacy, but it's a good point. And, uh, Dr. Schickler earlier in the chat uh, pointed out that an animal trial of parachute versus backpack from height might upset the PETA people, but would preclude progression to human studies. So I suppose, uh, you know, we, and we do use animal trials for lots of things, and it's a similar idea. Yeah, and, and Carrie, there's even a thing called the animal rule that FDA has, which basically says that if if it's, impractical or unethical to do a study in humans, but there's good evidence that a vaccine works in animals, it's possible to actually achieve approval that way. Um, so uh, that, that's also where the ethics are driving innovative ways to determine that you know, a product works and that we should be using it in the absence of a randomized controlled efficacy trial. Look. We have some uh, issues with that concept that Gary talked about with vaccines and the immunogenicity with regards to the use of biosimilars for the biologic drugs that we use for many things. The FDA has granted blanket uh, equivalency uh, with the use of biosimilar if it works 
similar to the original biologic for one disease, they granted use and labeling for use in every disease that the basic biologic is available for. And uh, there's some trepidation in uh, being able to extend that efficacy from one disease to another, uh, but the FDA grants it. Interesting. Hey, this is Kyle Brothers. I just wanted to throw out a few kind of updates on um, the Henrietta Lack story. So, um, first of all, I completely agree. You know that um, there were a number of um, injustices committed against Henrietta Lacks and her family over the years, but fundamentally, the the very original sample that was collected was a surgical sample collected from a biopsy. And, um, you know, the, the use of discarded surgical tissues for research purposes is still w without uh, explicit consent. We, we dump a uh, consent in the middle of the admission um, consent and um, the surgical consent, but no one ever fills out a research consent. But the use of discarded uh, t surgical samples is still very much allowed. So um, had the folks involved not collected additional samples later that were not necessary for clinical purposes, uh, the, what happened with the Henrietta Lacks, um, an initial Henrietta Lacks samples could have been done today in exactly the same way it was back then. Um, and then just another point, the question about whether, you know, science derived from HeLa cells um, you know, should be whether those insights should be used in uh, clinical practice today because the source of the information was unethically gained. Uh, the NIH has addressed this by um, forming a committee that includes Henry and Lacks descendants. And so uh, they use that committee to gain approval for studies utilizing HeLa cells, um, you know, in modern times as a way to sort of you can't undo the wrong, but to at least uh, provide some amount of empowerment for people that were harmed by, you know, these original uh, injustices. Hey, Kyle, could you uh, answer a question for us uh, regarding waste specimen studies? Because, you know, th this is something that's done very commonly where uh, specimens obtained for one reason, like let's say doing a CBC on a kid who's admitted might be used for another purpose, and if it's if it's done in a uh, completely de-identified fashion, then that's totally acceptable without consent, right? I mean, it needs to approve a protocol, but or, or does it? What what are the what's the yeah. irony around that? Yeah, you, that, that's true. Um, the definition of human subjects research is research that involves interaction between an investigator and a patient. Um, or research that involves the collection of identifiable information. So if you're conducting a study based on tissues or blood samples or in data even that was uh, collected from a person for clinical purposes with absolutely no change in that practice for research purposes, and then you're utilizing that sample or data without any identifiers, um, then that is permissible. Um, but of course there's a thousand different pieces to it and ultimately um, uh, even research that is 100% permissible without IRB approval still may need IRB review because the IRB um, has the right to determine whether your study meets the criteria for not requiring approval. You don't have that right, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I, just to make this really relevant, um, back in the spring of 2020, many institutions had the foresight to understand that specimens on COVID patients would be very valuable to understand the pathophysiology, et cetera. So a lot of them had protocols in place, which simply said, every COVID patient who's admitted, we are going to collect all the leftover blood. Um, and the leftover BAL specimens and the leftover whatever else got done. And those specimens were banked. And then post hoc, uh, research studies were done on those specimens and did not need consent from the patients. Yep, correct.
that's and again that's exactly um what happened with with henrietta lax but there were events that happened after that initial encounter that that would not be permitted today i think um you know ethics is so interesting or at least i think so and i'm trying to convince our trainees um of the same thing and you know, sometimes people will consult the, Dr. Brothers can attest to this, will consult us on the ethics committee regarding a patient and they want us to tell them the right answer. What should we do? What's the correct answer here? Um, so we can just document it and do it. And, you know, what makes ethics interesting, in my opinion, is sometimes there really isn't a right answer. It's more a question of how do you frame the problem and how do we address the different competing ethical claims, for example. Um, I had a I had a professor, an ethics professor in college, who had a sign outside his office, um, and it said, you know, my wife says that being married to an ethicist doesn't guarantee that I'll do the right thing. It only guarantees a lengthier discussion, uh -huh. which sounds which sounds pretty correct to me. Um, so sometimes, you know, a lot of the things that were considered appropriate in a different cultural. Um, in scientific era, we are rethinking them through a, a new lens, and it's important to keep that in mind even today. Yeah, I think this uh, ethical sense of ownership of uh, material of by the patient uh, goes over to education as well. I mean, certainly in the old days, I don't recall it being necessary to get patients' permission uh, to use images uh, of their x-rays if they were de-identified or photographs of their limbs uh, that appear in textbooks and get reproduced uh, after decades, but are essential for teaching uh, that still get used even though they came from an era before we got consent for reproducing uh, images uh, or taking uh, using their uh, photographs of their blood samples or x-rays. Uh, yet we do that, uh, or they continue to be reproduced in textbooks if they were old and valid uh, representations of certain diseases. Uh, continuing to use that would seem like a, a similar violation, although it's not for profit, it's for education. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting point, Dr. Schiffer. Uh, I think we're a little over our time here, so thank you everybody for coming. We enjoyed uh, giving this talk and enjoyed the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you all. It was a really good framed uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you. And with that, we will end grant rounds. The CME code is 130400. And if you have any questions, please email Julia Sparks or I, Addie Dotson. Thanks. Have a great day.